So it is my pleasure to introduce today Luis Aguilar as our colloquium speaker. Luis, uh, many of us know him as, as you can see by this chat, but he obtained his bachelor degree from UNAM, from the Facultad de Ciencias, and then his master and PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. And he made a postdoc at the Harvard CFA, Smithsonian CFA um, Center for Astrophysics in Harvard. And then he came back to Mexico where he works at the Institute of Astronomy in Ensenada. And Luis is an expert in galactic dynamics. And he is, um, in the recent years, he has been collaborating in particular with the Gaia project with European groups, especially in Barcelona. And he is also known for um, his teaching activities and outreach activities. He's an excellent teacher, as you will see today. So we will learn many things. And he was just uh, telling us, for the people who arrived late, that he has this boat where he sails in, in the Bay of Ensenada that is called Second Childhood. So that's, that gives mm. uh, some information about his uh, character. <laughs> so thank you, Luis, very much. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for the introduction, Susana. And once the pandemic is over, I mean, whoever come, wants to come here to Ensenada, they are welcome and we, I can take them to, to sail on the Bay of Ensenada. Okay, today I'm going to talk about gravel thermodynamics. So I have two background figures here, one on the left, which is about gravity and one on the right, which is about thermodynamic machines, okay? Well, before beginning, I have a disclaimer, okay? This is not going to be a regular colloquium in the sense that I'm going to be presenting some original research. Rather, what I want to do is to give you a glimpse on, in an interesting area of research that is seldom mentioned, but I find it very interesting and I hope that you also find interesting, okay? So this talk is more like a review of a given, a particular area of research. Well, so what is this thing about gravel thermodynamics? Well, we have two parts to it. On the one hand, we have gravity. On the other hand, we have thermodynamics. So I'm going to make an introduction to each one of them. So let's start with gravity. Okay, as you can see, this little cat is experiencing some unusual fluctuations in the gravity field. Okay, what about gravity? I'm going to be talking about gravity in the non-relativistic regime. So this is gravity Alan Newton. And so let's start at the beginning. Something that is curious about gravitational physics, uh, I don't know if you have a ponder about this, is that this historical development, the conceptual, the development of concepts is in, exactly inverted to all the other branches of physics. In the other branches of physics, we start with some empirical macroscopic description of the phenomenon. And it's only later on that we develop a, a fundamental theory about it, the basic interaction. So we go from thermodynamics to statistical mechanics, from fluid mechanics to kinetic theory of gases, and the bold properties of materials to atomic and molecular structure. You can see that on the left, I don't have notions of molecules or atoms. I don't need them. I just treat them, the whole thing as, as a continuous a fluid, whereas on the other side, side the, the, the presence of atoms and molecules is fundamental, okay? But in the case of gravity, we knew what was the basic interaction from the very beginning, thanks to this guy, Isaac Newton. Now, he never wrote the formulas we write it nowadays. What he wrote is what I reproduced him from the Principia Mathematica. And I don't know if you can read Latin, but at least I think that you can follow what I have highlighted here in red, that this uh, force goes as the reciprocal of the square of the distance between the planet centers, and that is proportional to the quantity of material in them. So this is what Newton really wrote. Of course, nowadays we, we, we write it like this. But this seems to be a very simple formula. I mean, they are not integral signs, not partial derivatives, just simple algebra. But nevertheless, within its simplicity, it hides a lot of complexity because its long range 
and it's also nonlinear in the distance. And as you're going to see, there's a lot of interesting behavior that arises because of this. So let's start with the long range behavior. Imagine that you have a huge cloud of particles, point mass particles, okay? And you're at the center, okay? And the particles are seeping by, moving back and forth, okay? And now I ask you to imagine two parcels of the system at different distances from you, but with the condition that on average, they're going to be exerting exactly the same force upon you, the same magnitude of force, okay? Well, then you know that you have to scale the size of these parcels so that the number of particles in each one of them goes as the distance to you square, so that the force upon you, the average force upon you is the same, very simple. And why is that? Well, the force scales as the number of particles in each parcel divided by the square distance. But what we care about here is not the magnitude of the force. What we want to know is how the force fluctuates because the force is not going to be constant. The force is going to be fluctuating because particles are coming in and coming out, okay? So the fluctuations in the force causes the fluctuations in number of particles, the instantaneous number of particles in the parcel divided by the distance square. And by Poisson statistics, this fluctuation in the number of particles just the square root of the number of particles. Okay, if I plug back this first relation that we have here, that n goes as r squared, we discover that the fluctuations in force go down with the distance as the reciprocal, one over r. So these parcels exact exactly the same magnitude of force upon me, but their statistical behavior is different. It's going to change with the distance. And that's important. Because then if I can imagine, for instance, here a plot of the instantaneous force upon me by parcels at different distances, I'm going to find out that although the average is the same for all of them by construction, the fluctuations are quite different. In the near part, I have an, an irregular behavior. And as, go, as I go to large distances, the behavior is smooth, smoother and smoother, okay? So we talk about two regimes. The regular one is dominated by near neighbor interactions and we call them collisions. Okay, whereas in the smooth part, that's due to the collection of distance particles. And this is the part that can be described by a global potential function. In the inner part, that wouldn't be the case. In the near, in the far away part, it will be the case. Now, associated to each spatial scale, I can associate a time scale. In the first case, it will be the collisional time. And in the second is what is called the dynamical time. Okay, and a very simple cartoon, uh, caricature, cartoon uh, uh, view of the, what is the dynamical and the collision time are, is here. The dynamical time is essentially time in which you go around the neighborhood, you go around the potential well. It's something like the period, okay? And if you want to assign a global dynamical time to the whole system, it's something like the size of the system divided by the RMS velocity. That's it, okay? In the case of the collisional time scale, it is like the timing which you are going to forget the memory of your initial conditions. Another way of putting it is that the change in energy due to collisions is equal to the, to the initial value you have for the energy, okay? And we're going to not going to derive it, but it goes like this. It goes like the size of the system divided by the RMS velocity, but times this purely numerical factor which is the number of particles divided by the logarithm of the number of particles. And what matters here is the ratio of the collisional time to the dynamical time scale, because this is going to give you the degree of collisionality, okay? It's not the collisional time per se, but it's the collisional time in units of the dynamical time. In other words, how long, how many periods, orbital periods you have to wait before collisions start being important. And the larger this ratio is, the less important are the collisions because you have to wait more, more, many more orbits before the collisions are really important. And you can see that the parameters of the system, the physical parameters have gone in the ratio. And the only thing that remains is something that depends on the number of particles. So that tells us right away that the larger the number of particles, 
the less collisional is the system. Okay. Now, this is very counterintuitive. I mean, I think that you will agree that there's more traffic accidents in Mexico City than in Morelia, just because there are many more cars in Mexico City than, than in Morelia. So how can I say that the more particles, the less important the collisions? Well, the important here is that what matters is not the number of collisions, it is their effect. Let's see. Imagine a particle system that is in equilibrium. Here you have all of these mosquitoes going around, their velocity vectors are indicated. But now we do something that observers cannot do, and that is we can have an imaging experiment. So I pull out a knife and I split into each one of those particles, okay? So now I have a system with a double the number of particles, which is still in equilibrium. So what is going to happen? Well, the rate of collision is immediately going to be multiplied by two because I have twice as many particles in the same volume. Then how can I say that collisions are less important? Well, let's see. The effect of an individual collision goes as the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance. If I split the particles in half, then M goes to one half of M. But the other, other hand, now we have more particles the same volume so the main separation is going to shrink. The mean separation goes as the number of particles to the minus one third power. If I now have twice as many particles, well, the mean separation is reduced by this factor. Finally, the correlation rate, as I said before, is just doubled. Now we put together all of them. The total effect of collision scales as the effect of an individual collision times the rate of collision. So here's the rate of collision and the effect of one collision. And now I substitute all of these factors that we worked out before. And if you do the algebra, you end up with the, uh, what the term that you had before multiplied by this factor, which is less than one. So you see the importance of collisions has gone down. It's not the same if you throw at me a bunch of sand grains or if you throw the same mass, but in bricks instead of uh, sand grains, that's the difference. So of course the number of collisions per unit time has gone up, but the importance, the overall importance of the collision has goes down, gone down, okay? And here's a little table, you have a stellar group, globular cluster, galaxies, cluster of galaxies. Here's the number of independent dynamical entities, which for the first cases are stars, and the, for the last case are the individual galaxies. And then you have the collision time and the dynamical time in millions of years, very roughly. And here's the, the ratio of them, okay? So a stellar group is completely a collisional system. You are never going to see that somebody studies a stellar group using, for instance, the Boltzmann equation, because the Boltzmann equation does not apply to collisional systems. For a galaxy, we use the Boltzmann equation because you have to wait 10 to the five periods of stars before collisions are important, and the universe is not old enough for stars to have had this many turns around the galaxy. The globular cluster is a very interesting system dynamically because it's the border between collisionality and non-collisionality. The core of a globular cluster is collisional, the envelope is not. Okay, and I'm going to be talking a lot about globular clusters, so I show you this plot over here. So what I have here in the abscissa is just the radial coordinate inside the globular cluster in units of the tidal radius. So it goes from zero in minus infinity in this log axis to one. And then I have a log axis for time here. Notice all of these orders of magnitude I have here. Now the red curve is the collisional time for this particular King model. And the upper dashed red line is the hover time, the, the age of the universe. And you can see that the crossing the, the, excuse me, the collisional time equals the age of the universe at this point. So I draw a vertical blue line here and everything to the left collisions are important. Whereas everything to the right collisions have not had enough time to be important. So the, the global cluster is a hybrid beast. In the inside is collisional, in the outside is non-collision. Another way of looking at this is by this data that I got from this reference, in which they plot the logarithm of the collisional time in years at the center of the cluster, 
versus the same with a half mass radius, okay? So looking at the center, you see that all of these globular clusters in this sample are to the left of the Hubble time. So collisions have already started playing a role. Whereas when you look at the half mass radius, two of them are already gone beyond. So this reinforces the idea that I, I told you before. Okay, let's put gravity aside for a while and let's talk about thermodynamics now. Well, this thing about gravel thermodynamics was originated with Lind Donald Lindenbell and Vladimir Antonov, okay? I got this picture of Lindenbell in the internet, but unfortunately I couldn't get a picture of Antonov. And these are the two papers that launched this area of research, Antonov on one side and Lindenbell and Good on the other side. Okay, sometimes it's interesting to treat a self-gravitating system like if it were a thermodynamic system. It's another way of looking at it and you can discover some interesting things. For instance, in a classic thermodynamic system, if you have a one system here whose internal energy is U sub one and another one whose internal energy is U sub two, if you put them together, the internal energy is just the sum of them. Because in thermodynamics, internal energy is just what is called an extensive thermodynamic quantity. It scales with the size of the system. But in a self-gravitating system, that's not the case. I have here one system with energy E1, another con energy E2. And when I put them together, it's not just the sum of the energies. Because since gravity is a long range force, I have to take into account the interaction energy, OK? So the first thing is that internal energy is no longer an extensive thermodynamic quantity. But the surprises don't stop there. If we're going to talk of gravitational systems as thermodynamical systems, I need to assign them a temperature. Well, we can do this, which is valid for monatomic gases, okay? And this is going to define me a local temperature. If I want to define a global temperature for the entire system, well, I can just use this expression over here. I just take the local temperature and average it over the whole system weighted by the local density, as simple as that. And then I can write a relation between the total kinetic energy of the system and this global temperature, where N is the number of particles in the system. Very simple. But then here comes the surprise. Virial equilibrium tells us that the energy is equal to minus the kinetic energy. But that is minus three half of NKT, we have seen that. Now the heat capacity of a system, this is just the derivative of internal energy with respect to the temperature. Is this derivative we have here? We can do the derivative very trivially and it's minus three half of N times K. But notice the heat capacity is negative. This is contrary to conventional thermodynamic systems. It means that if you pump positive energy into a system, a self-gravitating system, it's going to lower the temperature and vice versa. How can this be? Well, we can explain this with a binary. Okay, here we have a, here a binary system. Both stars are going around the very center. Now imagine that we extract positive energy from the binary. Okay, if we do that, the stars are now more bound than before and the orbits are going to shrink in size. But if they shrink in size, now the orbital velocity is larger. And since temperature is associated to the kinetic energy, the temperature has gone up. Okay, on the contrary, if I pump energy, positive energy into the system, well, the stars are now less bound they move to larger orbits and now they move slower, slower, which lowers the temperature. So you see the heat capacity is negative, contrary to the usual thermodynamic systems, okay? So extracting positive energy hits the system and injecting positive energy cools the system. And this is applies to all self-gravitating system, including black holes. When a black hole acquires more mass or energy, they become colder and colder. As they evaporate through Hawking radiation, they, hotter, they get hotter and hotter. So all self-gravitating systems have negative heat capacity, okay? And this is going to lead to some very interesting results that we are going to see later on in this talk. 
Now, imagine you have an isolated self-gravitating system that somehow is in thermal equilibrium. It's an isothermal sphere. So you have here the temperature as a function of radius inside the system, and it's just flat. Now imagine that you perturb it by introducing a slight gradient here, OK? And we ask ourselves, is this system going to be stable or not? Well, let's see. As soon as you have a gradient in temperature, you are going to establish a flux of energy, a, a flux of heat, OK? And it's going to be the sense of going from the hotter part to the colder part. But remember that we have negative heat capacity. So as the nucleus sheds more and more positive energy, it gets hotter and hotter. Whereas the envelope, as it absorbs more and more positive energy, gets colder and colder. But that's going to make the gradient even steeper, which feeds back into, into this heat uh, flux. And so we have a runaway instability. This is what is called the gravothermal catastrophe. Okay, so what is going to happen is that the system is going to start shrinking its nucleus and expanding the envelope. Okay, and all self gravitating systems suffer this or are going to suffer this. The only thing is that the time scale is set by the efficiency of heat transport. This is going to happen in the same amount of time, but time measured in units of the collisional time scale or whatever is responsible for the transport of energy from the nucleus to the envelope, okay? So this is an important lesson. All sterile systems have collisions. We consider them collisional or collisionless depending on whether the collisional time scale is shorter or larger than their age, okay? For instance, when a star leaves the main sequence in the HR diagram, what happens is that the hydrogen burning is no longer occurring at the core. So the, the star loses its equilibrium, its mechanical equilibrium, its hydrostatical equilibrium. And so gravity takes over and the gravothermal catastrophe is, starts occurring right away. So the core starts shrinking and the envelope starts expanding. And the time scale here is given by, the, by convection because here convection is the one that is transporting most of the energy to the envelope at this stage. But in this case, very quickly, quickly in evolu the stellar evolutionary time scales, the nucleus is going to reach a temperature in which the, the, the helium starts burning and so equilibrium is established. And now we park ourselves in the horizontal branch. But this climbing of the, the red supergiant uh, branch is due to the gravothermal catastrophe because for a moment, the equilibrium has been broken and gravity is taking over. And the same is the case with galaxies. I mean, galaxies seem to be collisionless systems, but that's only because their collisional time scale is much, much larger than the age of the universe. But as the universe ages, eventually all of these uh, galaxies are going to evolve towards the spheroidal systems. And at the end, all of them are going to tend to be just E zeros. It's just that the universe is not old enough for this to be seen. Okay. And it took a little bit of time for the community to accept this business about gravothermal dynamics. In fact, here's a review paper from 1999 by Linden Bell. And he is interesting what he says. He says, when I first used the concept of negative specific heat, to explain Antonov's remarkable gravothermal catastrophe, the statistical community thought I was talking nonsense. <laughs> so it took some time. Now, if we're going to talk about thermodynamics, we need to talk about entropy. So let me talk a little bit about entropy. Well, you can find definitions of entropy in many, in most of physics books. Okay, there are several definitions like, it is a measure of the energy that is not available to perform useful work. It's the amount of disorder in a system. It is the amount of additional information needed to specify the exact physical state of a system given its thermodynamical specification. It is the number of microstates that correspond to a given macrostate. I don't know about you, but when I started learning about this, I found all of these definitions very vague because they use terms that have not been defined properly. Like for instance, what is useful work? 
what is this order? What is the nature of the additional inform, information? What is a micro, micro state? What is a macro state? Okay. Well, the guy who invented entropy or introduced the concept in physics is this guy, Rudolf Clausius. He was studying the efficiency of the Carnot cycle and he introduces this concept. He invented the world using the Greek uh, root for transformation, okay, okay, which is trope, and then added the prefix n so that it would sound like energy, okay. Now the problem with the entropy, a la Clausius, is that it's derived from phenomenological considerations, and it's not based on fundamental concepts. So I cannot ex generalize it beyond the realm of thermodynamics. That's the problem. If I want to go beyond thermodynamics, I have to wait until the work of Ludwig Boltzmann, who introduced a proper definition that can be extended. This is famous Boltzmann uh, entropy formula, which in fact is in, the, in his tombstone in Vienna. And W is the number of microstates associated to a given macrostate. He didn't call it like that. He called it like this thing that I have here in German. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, uh, but essentially it means frequency of occurrence of a macrostate. Okay. Now, the entropy that is most used nowadays in physics is the one that was introduced by Joshua Willard Gibbs. Here he is, which is something like the probability of each microstate associated to a given microstate times the logarithm of that probability. And then I have a summation over the entire system, the configuration space for that system. Okay. Myths and thoughts about entropy. The list that I have here, I took from this reference, which is in physics and reviews of modern physics. If somebody is interested about this topic of entropy, I highly recommend this, this reference. It's very good. Okay. For instance, entropy has units of energy per degree Kelvin. But this is because we chose to measure temperature in degrees Kelvin. If we really measure temperature in energy units, which is what we should be doing, then entropy is dimensionless. Then the definition of entropy involves the definition of microstates. But this is an artificial construct within classical mechanics. Okay. But in quantum mechanics, I have a proper definition of microstate because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And entropy is very, very important in physics because it's the concept that links the macroscopic with the microscopic descriptions of a system in equilibrium. And in fact, this supposedly introduces the thermodynamic arrow of time. At least that's what Boltzmann thought. Nowadays, there's a lot of controversy around this, okay? Um, we can continue, like the basic concept of entropy has been applied to other areas of knowledge, like in information theory and data processing. I won't continue with this. I want to center on the one that I highlighted here in yellow, which says, there's no maximum entropy state in self gravitating systems. One can always increase the entropy, keeping the total mass and energy constant. This is very important. You see, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that a system is go going to try to increase its entropy all the time. If I, so eventually I'm going to reach the state of maximum entropy. Like when I, I, the ideal gas gets a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities. But if there's no maximum entropy state in a self-gravitating system, it means that the system is never going to reach equilibrium. It's always going to be evolving. And that's why this is important. So let's see if we can see why is that the case. Imagine a self-gravitating system, which is isolated, and we're going to split it into a core, which is which has mass M1 and radius R1, and an envelope, uh, which has mass M2 and radius R2. And the thing is that the envelope has much, much less mass than the core, okay? So the energy, the binding energy of the core, well, by varying equilibrium, goes as the potential energy of the system divided by two, which is just this quantity I have here. I, I should add here the interaction energy with the envelope I'm neglecting that, but I'm neglecting it because by, by construction, the mass of the envelope is much, much less than the mass of the core. Now, the energy of the envelope 
goes like this, which is the interaction energy between the envelope and the core. Here, I'm neglecting the envelope self energy. Because since M2 is much less than M1, I can neglect the self energy, which goes as M2 square. OK. Now we're going to squeeze a little bit the core. So the radius R1 is going to become R1 prime, which is 1 minus delta of the original radius, where delta is a small positive quantity. Then there's a change in energy. And the core is going to shed energy according to this, which is just the difference between the, the final and the initial energy. I can uh, simplify like this. And then since delta is a small, a small quantity, I can just approximate it like this. So this is the amount of energy that is going to shed the core. And since it's a positive energy, well, this is going to be producing an expansion of the envelope to a new radius, R2 prime. So the new energy of the envelope is the original energy must this energy that was shared by the core, which gives you this quantity over here. Then I use the virial theorem to link the new velocity dispersion of the envelope with the new energy on the envelope after the expansion. Okay, so the volume in phase space occupied by the envelope goes roughly like this dispersion velocity to the cube power and the size of it to the cube power. I already have an expression for the velocity dispersion. I do the algebra and I get this expression. I'm going a little bit fast here because I don't have much time, but I'm going to leave the copy of the slides here. So if somebody wants to follow this in detail, they can afterwards look at the, my slides. And if they have questions, just write to me. I apply here the, form, the Gibbs formula for the, for the envelope. I make some approximations and I get the entropy goes as n logarithm of the volume in phase space. OK, so I can compute what is the new entropy of the envelope. I have to plug in the new volume and the new number of particles. I put it here. I do some more algebra. Sorry about this. I'm going really very fast. But what happens is that the entropy of the envelope is going to have this form. And look, I have here the logarithm of the binding energy of the envelope plus the energy that it had to absorb the one that originated with the core. And here's the interesting thing. The binding energy is by definition negative because the envelope is bound. But delta E is positive. So the more delta E, the less bound is the envelope. Okay, And in the limit in which delta E is equal to the binding energy in absolute value, this argument goes to 0. But logarithm of 0 is minus infinity. And with this minus is plus infinity. So as the envelope expands, the entropy grows and grows and grows without any limit. The only while at the same time the core is shrinking. Okay. So an isolated self-gravitation system can always increase its total entropy by shrinking its main bulk while having its envelope expand. There's no maximum entropy configuration for this system. Now I did this, but there's an easier way to look at this. I'm going to present now something which is not formal at all. It's a more uh, heuristic argument, but it's more visual. So it's uh, designed for the other side of the brain. Let's see. Let's imagine a function, which is just a decay in exponential. And we ask the constriction that the area under the curve is always the same, equal to one. So that ties the coefficient to the alpha exponent that I have here. In the sense, I have to be the same. So as alpha shrinks, the function gets more spread out. OK? Now, I can evaluate what is the entropy of this system. Since this is analytical and very simple, I can do the evaluate the integral. And it's just one of alpha. OK? So I have here a plot of entropy as a function of alpha. And you can see that as I have a more spread out function, that is alpha is smaller, alpha is smaller, the entropy goes up and up and up. So as the distribution function becomes more spread out, the entropy increases. That is the key to having larger entropy. 
And it's the log function that is given a bigger weight to the f function at large x values. For instance, if I spread up to very large, where f is like 10 to the minus 8, well, minus log f is like 8. So the key to maximize my entropy is to make the function more spread out. But you're going to say you are, you are cheating because you're showing me a function of just one variable, x, whereas you're talking about a function of a phase space, which has at least, at least two variables, one position and one velocity. So you have here uh, two choices. You can spread out in position or you can spread out in velocity. Of course, by conservation in energy, you have to shrink in the other coordinates. So in what direction is the entropy more efficiently maximized? Well, you get the answer from the Virial theorem, twice the kinetic energy is minus the potential energy. In other words, D squared goes like this. And if you take the differential of this expression, you say that it pays more to spread out in position than in velocity because of this factor of two. So it's better to spread out in space, in configuration space, rather than velocity space. And that's what these systems are going to try to do. Okay, let's look at uh, two more realistic models, like a king model. I mean, here I have here a globular clusters, and you see that is very well fit by the by the by this king model. Well, I have here the density profiles for different uh, king models, and what I did is that I computed the Gibbs entropy integral for various king models with different concentrations. Remember the concentration is the logarithm, let me go back, is the concentration of the logarithm of the tidal radius divided by the core radius. So the larger this number, the more concentrated the system is. Well, you can see right away here, that as the, as the concentration grows, the entropy also grows. So in time, all globular clusters are going to be evolving through this sequence of King models getting more and more and more concentrated. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the gravothermal collapse. Here's a simulation. I took this from this reference, okay? They are plotting as a function of time, the Lagrangian radius, the one that, I don't know, this is like, encloses 5% of the mass of the system, 10%, 20%, 30%, something like that. I forgot the real numbers, the real numbers. But what is important here is that you can see that the core is shrinking while the envelope is expanding. So this is the gravothermal collapse happening in this simulation. Okay. Another way of looking at it is this other uh, figure that I took from Takahashi et al. in 1995. And what he's plotting is the density profile as a function of time. This is logarithm of the radius versus logarithm of density. So here I have the first density profile, the initial one. And as time passes, it starts evolving into these other density profiles until at the end of the simulation, we're here. Look at the density at the center of the system. In log from, goes from zero to 14. The density, the central density is increasing by 14 orders of magnitude. But 14 orders of magnitude in density means like a factor of 50,000 in distance, in linear distance. So one per sec shrinks to about four astronomical units. So instead of having stars separated by parsecs, I now have stars separated by astronomical units. Uh, units. So this is pretty extreme. Then most globular clusters should have grown black holes of many solar masses at their centers. Now people have looked for these black holes of several uh, solar masses and they haven't been able to find them. What they have found is that there are lots of binary stars. So what's going on? So let me talk a little bit about binary stars. The interesting thing is that binary stars, well, the size of stars is completely negligible compared to the separation between the stars. Typically at the sun position, if I use the Allen and Santillan model of the galaxy, well, I find that stars are like a factor of 10 to the seven smaller than the typical separation. So that means that in the encounters, the stars behave like 
point masses and the internal degrees of freedom are not important. So collisions are completely elastic. The energy you have at the beginning is the energy you are going to have at the end. So this is very boring. But what happens if you have a binary system colliding with the third particle, a third star? Well, now you have two sources of binding energy. One is the encounter energy and the other is the binary energy, okay? Here I have in a log-log plot, just a Kepler potential, okay? The, the abscissas and parsecs. So here's the mean separation of, sor of uh, stars in the solar neighborhood. Here's the orbit of Neptune and here's the orbit of, uh, of Earth. So you see, this is the typical energy on an encounter in the solar neighborhood. But if you manage to collide with a binary, which is separated by the orbit of Neptune of one astronomical perdimos. unit. Okay, somebody talk? Well, I'll continue. All of a sudden you are opening up a lot of energy that can really change the collisions. Now, what can happen? Well, you have the binary here and you have the intruder and you destroy the binary. So this is the binary destruction or ionization, if you want to call it like that. And the opposite, the reverse in time, which is the binary formation. And then you have the flybys where the binary survives, but the orbital parameters of the binary have changed. Then you have also something which is more complicated, which is the partner exchange, where you have a binary at the beginning and you also have a binary at the end, but it's not the same binary because the intruder managed to get into the binary, expelling one of the original members of the binary. Okay, here's a real example taken from this reference. You see, there's a, the binary formed by particles one and two. There's a third particle that comes over here. And after many complex interactions, finally there's a new binary, which is one and three, and two goes the other way. So you see, see things can get very complicated, like, social interactions <laughs> okay in fact this uh, you can do a dissection of what's happening here you get the binary one and two coming with the perturber three that's stage age then two is unfaithful and goes with the third guy and leaves the one alone in a very elongated orbit and stage v this gets very complicated you really have a menage a trois and finally, at the end, you have the outcome of the new binary one and three with two going the other way. Now, in order to specify completely one of these encounters, you need a lot of parameters. I'm not going to describe them one by one because I don't have time, but there you have them. The important thing for us here is that we're talking about nine parameters. So this, this is a vast parameter space to explore. Uh, so what do we do? Well, let me describe you a very simple numerical experiment. This was done by this guy, Pete Hott, in the 80s. He was at the time at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Well, he's still there. And what he did is to study interaction between a binary and a third particle, but in a simplified setup. Everything is two-dimensional. The binary is always initially in a circular orbit, and he only plays with three parameters the impact parameter, which is zero for a head-on collision with the very center of the binary, positive for prograde encounters, and negative for retrograde encounters. You have the orbital phase of the binary at the moment in which the experiment begins. And finally, you have the encounter velocity. Okay? I'm going to show you a series of diagrams in which the abscissa is the phase, initial orbit, binary orbital phase. And the ordinate is the impact parameter. So remember, the upper part is prograde, the lower part is retrograde, and everything is going to be at a given fixed velocity. Okay, we start with a very large encounter velocity, six times the critical velocity. This is the critical velocity that makes the overall energy of the system equal to zero. Now, there's a whole mesh of experiments here. Where you see empty space, it's not that there's no experiment, it's just that it's a flyby, okay? Where you see an asterisk is that there was a binary destruction or binary ionization. And you see that we have these peculiar bands that spread out and then come back again and spread out and come back again. 
This is easy to understand. When the orbital phase is zero, the binary is aligned with the path of the intruder. And then if you have an impact parameter near zero, you're going to maximize the, the probability of destroying the binary. That's why you have the ionization region here. But as you start increasing the orbital phase, the binary separate at, at 90 degrees or 270 degrees of orbital phase, they are maximally separated. So if you go through impact parameter equals zero, you don't destroy the binary. You have to be either at the position to hit the upper binary member or the lower one. That's why you have these two regions and then it comes back again. So this explains the morphology of this ionization bands. As we start lowering the velocity, these bands start getting thicker and thicker. And then all of a sudden at four times the critical velocity, you have these regions that I a color in green and blue, which are partner exchange. I start exchanging partners with member number one or member number two of the binary. Okay. Also notice that the is more likely to interact in a prograde collision than in a retrograde collision. We keep doing that and look at what happens at the critical velocity. I no longer have by ionization. I only have flybys of partner exchanges. But look at the complicated geometry of these regions. I wonder if, if I had just described to you the setup, this primitive setup, you will guess that we are going to get this kind of uh, regions in solution space. And when we go be below the critical velocity, now we get these islands of resonant encounters. Okay, So this gets very complicated. And we're talking about a very simplified version of the three body problem. Well, this is work that was done long ago, early 80s. Let me show you the results of a more recent work. This is from 2020. This is a different uh, cut in, in solution space, but this is again the three body problem and look all the complicated results that we have here. So even the planar three body problem is quite complicated. Well, well, and um, so what? Okay, I'm running out of time. Let me skip a bit these plots and I'm going to jump to this. It turns out that binaries can be split into two classes, soft and hard binaries. And that's because the collision cross section weighted by the change in energy changes sign between one of them and the other. In a soft binary, we define it like the binding energy of the binary in absolute value is less than the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of the field stars. On the contrary, in the hard binary, the binding energy of the binary is much larger than the kinetic energy of the field stars. Soft binaries are Y binaries because they have low binding energy. Hard binaries are close together. Now, when we have an encounter, uh, a change in the energy of the binary is positive here, where it's negative over there. And as a result of that, the velocity of the perturber after encounter gets lower down in a soft binary, whereas it's increasing the hard binary. Let's understand this a little bit more with, again, a heuristic model. Okay, this is a cartoon model. Let's start with a soft binary. In a soft binary, the binary is wide, and so the orbital velocity is small compared with the perturber velocity. So when there's a close encounter with one of the members of the binary, you are going to have a, a energy exchange. And because of energy equipartition, the intruder that is going very fast is going to give energy to the binary member. Because of this, the perturber goes after the collision with smaller velocity. But the binary having absorbed positive energy now is in an even wider binary and so it goes even slower. With a hard binary, now it's the opposite. The velocity of the perturber is small compared with the orbital velocity in the binary. After the collision, because of the energy equipartition, the binary member gives energy to the perturber, which goes 
after the collision with a larger velocity. I'm exaggerating the, the arrows here just to emphasize this. But having lost positive energy, the binary shrinks to a tighter binary, and so its orbital velocity is larger. So the soft binary gets softer, softer, the hard binary gets harder. But the important thing for the rest of the system is that soft binaries are heat sinks for the ambient stars, but they are going to disappear after a few encounters, so they are irrelevant. But high, hard binaries are heat sources, and they're going to become harder and harder. They do not disappear, and they are going to heat up the kinematics of the ambient stars. Okay? And everything is due to the negative heat capacity of gravitational systems. Well, and what does this have to do with the, with the expected, globular, uh, expected black holes at the center of globular clusters? Well, let's talk about gravothermal pulses. As the gravothermal collapse proceeds, the density in the center gets very large. And so binaries start forming. You have three ways of forming binaries. The density is so, so high that you start having three body interactions. And so the third particle can fly away with the excess energy and then a binary form. The other is through tidal interactions. Now you no longer can neglect the internal degrees of freedom of the stars. The tidal force makes work over the shape, the internal degrees of motion of the stars. And so you lose binary energy and they, they become bound. And what happens with this? Well, here's a simulation of the behavior of the central density of a globular cluster as a function of time. And you see, initially, it is collapsing. But then it starts coming back. And then you see these pulses, which are called the gravothermal pulses. But the general trend is that the core is expanding. What is the difference of this simulation with the previous one? That now they have in, in, introduced the binary third body interaction cross sections into these simulations. So binaries are acting here, okay? So at first the core collapse proceeds as usual, but then it gets reversed and the core begins to expand. And this coincides with the formation of a very first hard binary core. Okay, so the story is as follows. The core collapse proceeds as usual until binary starts to form the core and hard binary dominates. The hard binary kick starts around, hitting the medium and halting the collapse. As it gets ever harder and harder and harder, the recoil of the binary increases until the binary itself gets expelled from the core and core collapse resumes. But then new binaries form and eventually one hard binary dominates and the whole story repeats itself. Uh, I don't have time to get into this, but there's detail, details to us about this in which you can see how the core is evolving. And here's the binding energy in hard binaries. And you can see that every time a new hard binary forms, there's a kick and there's a gravothermal pulse here. Okay. And the theoretical prediction is that these gravothermal pulses are going to lead to the formation of a power low density profile at the very center. And this has already been observed. This is a real globular cluster, cluster in which you see this power law at the very center. Okay. Uh, Donald Linden Bell has summarized this strange behavior of binaries in the what is called now the Linden Bell laws. The first one is that the rate of hardening of a criminal is independent of his hardness once he has become a hard criminal. Second, the most violent criminals commit few crimes, but these are very violent. Softer criminals commit more crimes, but these are less violent. Small societies evolve until they are dominated by a very violent criminal that expels other members of the society. Eventually, this criminal is expelled too when interacting violently with another society member. And finally, all societies develop a small clique that dominates them. Eventually, this group may become dominated by a very violent criminal. So there you have it. He has summarized all of this behavior I told you about in these rules. Okay. At the end, it is ironic that the collapse of a self-gravitating system, like a global cluster, is stopped by the collapse of another such system, a hard binary, which lies at a much smaller scale within the first one. Okay, I have run out of time. 
so I, to say, uh, as you have seen, the thermodynamic behavior of gravitating system is non-trivial and quite interesting. I'm going to stop here. The main points are gravitating systems have negative specific heat. Gravitating systems do not have a maximum entropy state. Entropy in gravitating system increases as their density contrast increases. That's the gravothermal catastrophe. Binaries can act as energy sources and affect significantly the evolution of the system they belong to. And even a problem as simple as the three body gravitational encounter has a very rich solution in space. Let me tell you that I have a few more slides in which I talk about the entropy of the universe, but I have run out of time. So I'm going to stop here, we can have questions. And at the end, if some people are interested in this final part, I can talk about these final slides with whoever is interested. Okay, Sondar? Very interesting. Now, we already have uh, Enrique, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, ah, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, I, well, I have several questions, but uh, I'll choose two of the most uh, interesting ones. First, um, you mentioned, uh, well, at, at several points, you used the standard burial equilibrium uh, relation that twice the kinetic energy equals the gravitational energy. But it was my impression that the system was not really in equilibrium because it was contracting. Uh, so uh, we have found the instances in which uh, you can have like a pseudo burial uh, behavior, but in a system that is out of equilibrium. So is it valid to us to use the equilibrium condition here when, when the system is precisely going out of one equilibrium and perhaps moving into another or something? Okay, let me address this one. Uh, remember the gravothermal collapse is going mm -hmm. to go at the time scale of whatever is producing the flux of energy from the inside to the outside. Okay. In the case of globular clusters, the collisional time scales are really large compared with the local dynamical time scale. So okay. in that sense, gravothermal collapse is happening slowly. Okay. Okay. The other thing is that the virial theorem does not apply only to systems in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. It also applies to systems in quasi equilibrium. Let's see. You derive the virial theorem from the second time derivative of the moment of inertia, mm -hmm. okay? And you ask for that to be zero, okay? A system mm -hmm. in equilibrium, the first time derivative is already zero. Mm -hmm. For the second time derivative to be zero, you don't need to be in equilibrium. It's enough that the first time derivative is linear in time, mm -hmm. okay? And that happens when systems evolve, but in quasi-equilibrium, slowly. Okay. So it's valid to apply the virial equilibrium. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not a, something which is fast, as it could be the case, for instance, for a start that abandons the main sequence. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the second question? Oh, okay. Well, actually, the second is, is more like a comment, uh, it, but th this is uh, more something that we can talk about later. Uh, in one of my students' uh, research, we have seen something that looks exactly like you were mentioning about the core and the envelope. So, but yeah. this applies to gas. Uh, and so the, the question is whether this view can uh, be applied to a gaseous system as well. But we have been looking at, at, the, at the evolution of cores and we see that precisely the central part gets denser while the outer, while the uh, more diffuse part gets more dispersed, and uh, that that's the evolution that we have been observing. We we have been attributing it to the conservation of angular momentum, but it's interesting to see uh, it viewed from the perspective of ent entropy. Although uh, these are gaseous clumps, and so I don't okay. know to what ex extent the same formalism could be applied. You are getting to something that is very interesting, mm -hmm. but also a bit mm -hmm. complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you can write to me and then we can exchange some ideas. Uh -huh. In fact, in the other part, the final part of my talk about thermodynamics of the universe, I'm going to talk a little bit about hybrid systems, which are mm -hmm. part ideal gas and part uh, gravitation systems. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to talk about very cartoonish uh, view. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but they are people who have actually worked out these kind of things of hybrid systems in which in one part they are dominated by like an ideal gas and the other part is self-gravitating and i can mm -hmm. give you some reference about this okay okay yeah that, that'll be interesting thank you okay uh, rosa yeah, I, very nice, um, Luis. I have always liked this subject very much. Uh, so when the hard binaries start injecting energy in the core and the core collapse stops or even reverses, do you also get something going on in the envelope? Does the um, expansion of the envelope also stops? Well, no, the expansion continues as, as usual. Uh, it takes only a few stars to change radically the collapse of the core, but it's going to take a lot of particles really changing the kinematics of the envelope. You are going to change the kinematics of the envelope because you are going to be producing a radial bias in the velocity ellipsoid because most of the stars are coming from the, from the core. But that's going to proceed, that's going to change the local behavior much more slower. At least that's what we get from the simulations. Okay, so as far as the envelope is concerned, nothing has happened in the in the core. Okay, okay, which would be different from what happens in giant stars. Once you hit the core, the expansion of the envelope stops, or maybe it doesn't, or you lose it. Well, <laughs> once you uh, start the helium burning at the core, you have established equilibrium. And so there's no longer gravothermal collapse. Mm -hmm. So the star is going to settle into its new hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that the envelope has to shrink. Mm -hmm. So you go to the horizontal so, okay. line. So in, in globular clusters, the gravitational the, the catastrophe, the gravothermal catastrophe is, does not stop ever. No, no. You are going to go through some... Uh, gravothermal pulses, but eventually what is going to happen, nobody knows because nobody has done simulations long enough. This is the kind of work in which the analytical study gets very complicated very soon. And you have to assume so many assumptions that nobody believes the, the predictions anymore. And so you have to do simulations, okay? okay. But nobody yeah. has done simulations long enough to see what happens at the very end. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Rosa. We have uh, one uh, question from Javier. Uh, hola, Luis. Uh, hola. So, uh, hola, hola. Uh, so I was wondering, um, well, I have a comment and, and a couple of comments and, and a question. So the question is, uh, in the case of the King profiles, those are supposed to be the, the, the natural evolution of a cluster uh, after long times, no? But, yeah. but in the profile that you show, I don't know if I saw it properly, there is a kind of cutoff at large scales. So it's not that it's really expanding all the way to infinity. That's a good observation. Yes, let me see. Well. I forgot where I have it. But <laughs> I I they, they were, you have the density profiles and they're evolving, evolving, and the central density profile is increasing. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. I think here. it's earlier uh, than that. Yes, let me see. Before that. Here it is. Uh -huh. This is the one you're talking about, right? No, I was uh, thinking in the King's uh, profiles that you showed. Well, this is a King profile to okay. start with, and then it's evolving. Down. Okay. But you see the envelope is staying large. It's the mm -hmm. core that is shrinking. Mm -hmm. okay. so perhaps it was this one? No, the, there was another one where you have the, 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 the concentration. And it was clear, more clear, but maybe it's just the, the, the way in which you made the dimensionalization, I don't know. Well. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so, so, so you say that anyway, it, there is some cut, kind of cutoff, but still it's quite large. That's what you will say. Yes. Okay. Okay. The, now the, the, the other comment is uh, in the case of stellar clusters, you have between 
dozens and few thousand members. So then the dynamical time, the collision time scale compared to the dynamical time scales is right between few and some, no? It's, it's around 10 or 20, something like that, which in terms of the of actual time scales, is comparable to the to the time in which you get rid of the gas if you are forming a cluster, no? So it's kind of a, just just to, to to tell you that maybe you can include those in in your slide, no? Uh, because you you have just very small stellar groups, and then go jump into the globular cluster that has so many members, no? I think. It, well, I did that on purpose because. Uh... I mean, to model a globular cluster is far easier than to model uh, a star for mid region. Mm -hmm. A star for mid region is a real nightmare for a theoretician because you have a bunch of stars. The number of stars is not conserved. New stars are being formed. You are in part self gravitating, but in part you are within the potential well of a gaseous mass which surrounds it, you. And not only that, because of the wind you are producing, you are dispersing that gaseous mass. So the contribution to the binding energy due to, to the gas is decreasing. And on top of that is precisely what you said, the different time scales are of the same order, all of them. So everything is acting at the same time. This is very complicated. So the only way to really approach this is through simulations. Mm -hmm. And then you approach a theoretician who after looking at the results is going to say, of course, we expected this because of this, of this, of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and, and then uh, regarding Enrique's uh, comment, I will, I will think that the, the rotational catastrophe of course also in course, but maybe it's enhanced, no? Because of, of thermal pressure of the gas. So then you kind of expand a little bit more the envelope than it, it will, you will do in, in a stellar cluster, no? Yes, that, that's that a possibility. In fact, this is a very fascinating problem, and that's why I'm collaborating with you <laughs> in this <laughs> <Okay>. problem, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Thanks, Javier. Uh, we have time for one more question, if anyone has any. Okay. It's, it's, Just one comment. I'm going to leave these slides with Sonder. Yeah. So you want to review them with, the, with your time at your own pace, you can do it. And if you have any questions, just write to me. So when are you going to talk about the thermodynamics of the universe? Well, if you want, I can do it now. OK. I have time. I can yes. stay. Should, should yes. I go ahead, Sonder? Yes, yes. Yeah, go for it. I'll record it as well. Yes, I have to ask the the owner of the circus because the owner of the circus says when the clowns come out. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about the thermodynamics of the universe. Obviously, I don't work on this. I'm just a fan of this field and I read what, whatever articles I can read about this and understand. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about this. Okay. As far as we can tell, the early universe, looking at the cosmic background radiation, was a universe with very uniform distribution of matter. And the radiation was, by all purposes, a perfect black body radiator, okay? We're used to see these images of the sky with the cosmic background radiation. But this is in some sort a lie because they are turning the contrast knob at maximum in this picture. A more realistic picture could be like this other one, okay? Because those fluctuations are only like one part in 10 to the five. So you see the universe, at least at the epoch of recombination, is a place which has practically constant density and radiation is a black body. But that is a maximum entropy configuration, okay? So how is the universe going to go from that maximum entropy configuration to form galaxies, stars, planets, living creatures, if it's going to obey the second law of thermodynamics that says that entropy is always increasing. We know that this is not an exact law, this is a statistical law, but it's uh, satisfied the overwhelming majority of times. So how do we go 
from the left to right. Well, the key to this is what I've been telling you in this talk. If I give you this, um, the left frame as initial conditions of an ideal gas enclosed in a box, you're going to say, this is not in equilibrium. And as time passes, we are going to move from left to right. And the maximum entropy configuration is the last frame where I'm close to constant density, okay? But that's for an ideal gas. For gravity, it's exactly the opposite. When I start with a uniform density, this is the minimum entropy. And as time passes, gravothermal catastrophe is going to produce these shrinking cores and expanding envelopes. So the entropy runs in the opposite direction for gravitational systems. And that's the key to understand the growth of structure in the universe. Okay. We have various sources of entropy in the universe. We can compute the entropy of the baryonic matter and dark matter, the, baryon the entropy for photons, the entropy for black holes, even the entropy associated to a cosmological constant. Okay. In the early universe after inflation, well, we have the, that the entropy of the photons and matter dominates. Then the entropy of the black holes is going to dominate as it is the case in the universe right now. And eventually, if the expansion of the universe continues exponentially, it is the cosmological constant entropy that is going to dominate. Okay. Now, most of the entropy in the present universe is the form of supermassive black holes. The entropy goes as the area of the event horizon in units of the Planck area. Now, the Schwarzschild radius is scales like the mass of the black hole. So the area scales as the square of the mass of the black hole. So that means that you have a black hole over here with its entropy, another black hole over there with its own entropy, and you merge them, you end up with more than just that the sum of the individual entropies. So if you, uh, merging together black holes is increasing the entropy, okay? And I have here this plot that I took from this reference in NAPJ 2010, in which they have in black like the mass function for the black holes. Here is the region of supermassive black holes. Here are black holes like in the center of our galaxy and they don't plot the stellar mass black holes, okay? The interesting thing is the green curve, which is the entropy density contributed by these black holes. And you see black holes like the ones at the center of our galaxy are not important. It is the most massive, supermassive black holes, the ones that are soaking up most of the entropy of the universe. And in that reference, they do a very rough calculation of what is the entropy at, in the present universe for black holes, photons, neutrinos, dark matters, etc., ending up with stars. Now, obviously, these are very rough figures, but I want to look at the order of magnitude here. Okay, look at the huge difference between black holes and everything else. Okay, the interstellar medium or intergalactic medium and the stars go at the very bottom. So in terms of entropy, we're just a little tiny fluctuation. Right now, most of the entropy of the universe resides in this supermassive black hole at the center of some galaxies. Okay, and that is good news for us because it is the increasing entropy of the universe in black hole that is going to allow the structure to grow in the rest of the universe. And so we can form stars, okay? This is this picture that I took from a preview paper by Albert. I was amused to see that this kind of picture, I'm sure that the, his son or his daughter is the one who did it. The idea is that the sun radiates energy on a tree, the dinosaur eats that tree, dies, is remnants, remnants get compressed, you produce oil or gas, and then you use that in order to feed a pump that is going to put the gas in this container in a very low entropy state in which all the molecules are on one side. And what happens here is that since there's thermal equilibrium for Earth, the amount of energy that it absorbs from the sun is the same amount of energy to first order that is 
reflected back, well, not reflect, emitted back to the space. But the difference is that the radiation that comes in is at a higher temperature than the temperature that the Earth, the radiation that the Earth is radiating back, which is a lower temperature in the infrared. But then the number of photons is different. So the sun is giving us a certain amount of energy in a given number of photons. But the Earth is turning back that same energy, but in a lot larger number of photons. But the larger the number of photons, the more degrees of freedom in phase space. So the energy, the infrared energy that the Earth radiates back to space has a lot more entropy than the entropy of the sun, of the, of the radiation from the sun that we absorb. And it's that differential in entropy that we can use on Earth to grow structure. Now, this is an interesting concept that, that is worked out by Line Weaver in this reference, but some other authors have already expressed the same idea. Here we have the time for the universe, and here's the entropy of the universe. Now, I told you before that there's no maximum entropy configuration for self-gravitating system. Well, that's not quite true, because once you form a black hole, Whatever happens inside the event horizon is casually, causally disconnected from the rest of the universe. So the rest of the universe doesn't care anymore. So there's a maximum entropy configuration, which is when, once the black hole has been formed. So you can compute what is the maximum entropy possible of the universe, which is when all the matter has collapsed into black holes beyond event horizons. And let's say that this is the initial entropy of the universe. The universe is born with this amount of entropy. So as time passes, entropy is growing, growing, growing. And let's say that at present we're here. So this differential in entropy is something like the measure of the free energy that is left in the universe to drive all the purposes. Once that has shrunk to zero, that will be really the thermodynamic death of the universe. So what, uh, what uh, permits the growth of the structure of the universe is that the universe started with a very low entropy state, gravitational entropy. Then the question is, how did the universe acquire this very special initial state? And this is not trivial at all, because we usually study friedman lemaitre models. But in friedman lemaitre models, you put the homogeneity and isotropy as part of the definition. Okay, so you're already biased to study this kind of very low entropy universe. The universe need not start like this. So what is the possible answer? Well, inflation, because in inflation, the idea is that you have something called the inflaton field, which pervades the entire universe. And at one point, it, 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 have, well, it has a, a, a potential energy associated to it. And the potential energy is frozen in a false vacuum state. And then at one point, there's a phase transition. And then you decay to the true vacuum. And what is going to happen that while you are rolling down, the universe behaves like a de-sitter universe in which you have a cosmological constant associated to the vacuum energy of this potential associated to the inflaton field. And so the universe expands tremendously. And at the end of the expansion, all of this latent heat or latent energy of the phase transition is released. And that's what forms particles in the universe as we have now. So that's the story I tell you, that they tell you. But it turns out that it's only a tiny fraction of forms of the inflaton field that give you this kind of behavior. You need to satisfy this condition which is this low rollover condition that tells you that the magnitude of this energy is much larger than the derivatives of this inflaton field with respect to these parameters that define the inflaton field, okay? So something that they don't tell you that much is that you really have to contrive a lot the form of the inflaton field to produce an inflationary universe. 
Of course, nowadays the fans of the inflationary universe use the anthropic principle and say, well, we have to live in the universe in which we have this particular inflaton field, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So is this the end of the story? Well, is this really the case that we live in a universe that is becoming more and more dominated by a cosmological constant? then we no longer live in a Freeman metro universe. We live in a Seater universe, which is going to be expanding exponentially. And the scale of expansion is given by the cosmological constant, which is, as his name says, constant. And this is the entropy of the universe. This is going to be the overall entropy of the universe asymptotically. And this is going to be the true thermodynamic end of the universe. Now, something I just discovered recently that I don't quite understand yet, but I'm just going to put it over the table that I find very interesting is the following. Look, in physics, it has no meaning to talk about something you cannot measure or prove its existence, even if it's indirectly, like this idea about how many angels you can fit inside there, a pin head, okay? That, that's not physics, that's metaphysics or philosophy or speculation, whatever you want. Well, look at it. For massless particles like photons, there's no time and there's no space. Why? Well, here's a Minkowski diagram, okay? The vertical axis is time and the horizontal plane is space, okay? And you have the future light cone and the past light cone. And these other hyperboloids are surfaces of, of constant interval se uh, uh, separation between events and photons move along the light cones. So they don't intersect other hyperboloids. They only move along the light cones. So for them, time does not exist. Like if you go to the observatory and take an image of the Andromeda Nebula, the photons that you got in your frame of reference started two million years ago in the Andromeda Nebula. Okay, but as far as the photon is concerned, the travel was instantaneous. The emission and the absorption is instantaneous. Time does not exist and distance does not exist at all. So does it make sense to talk about time in a universe where only photons and the cosmological constant exist? I think not. So, in fact, this guy, Roger Penrose, very famous, has proposed a new cosmology, which is called conformal cyclic cosmology, which uses this. The idea is that we're here somewhere here. The universe is expanding. We're getting into a de-sitter stage, but eventually all the matter is going to collapse into black holes. And eventually all the black holes are going to disappear because they are going to evaporate into photons. You end up with a universe in which you only have photons and a cosmological constant. But then at this point, time does not exist. How do you measure time? How do you measure distances? You only have massless particles. So no, it no longer makes sense to talk about volumes and time. So he does a conformal mapping into a new stage which starts shortly after a singularity. And this is the beginning of a new stage of the universe in which the inhabitants of this new universe are going to be looking at the back at something that looks like the inflationary period. But that inflationary period is in reality the deceiver stage of the previous universe. He calls them eons, the first eon, the same, well, the previous eon, the actual eon, the future eon. And that's what is called conformal cyclic cosmology. As I said, this is something I discovered recently and I'm just starting to read about this. But something that really intrigues me is that this is true, that if you have a universe of just massless particles, uh, talking about time and space at distances is meaningless. Okay, I think this is really the end. Thank you. Thanks very much again, Luis.
Uh, so I will contact you. Um, oh, we have questions. Okay. Well, uh, Enrique, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, this, this is fascinating. This is the stuff uh, is best to talk about uh, with a beer, uh, perhaps a, a napkin to take notes, no? Uh, just to add, uh, how to say, wood to the fire or something like that. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, it is, it's always struck me, uh, at least for the last few years, that gravity is really strange. I mean, uh, I think all of these uh, weird behaviors that you have talked about come from the fact that gravity has a sort of negative energy. So in fact, I have heard uh, people say that the, the, the total energy of the universe is zero, no? And, if it's and, a flat universe, that's the case. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so it's funny that to, to have zero energy and have a universe that's full of stuff, no? Um, and, and, uh, but it's because we, we think of energy as a positive definite quantity, but it is not. Uh, gravity has like a negative energy. And I think it's reflected on the fact that you have a negative heat capacity also for gravitational systems. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it just struck me uh, or stricken me. I don't know. Uh, but the, in the past, but I think this real mystery there, I mean, uh, uh, the nature of gravity is really strange. And I think that's what gives all these strange behaviors and 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 just like you said i had never realized the, the fact that it is precisely this opposite behavior of gravity uh, how it increases its entropy that allows for the formation of all the structure in the universe so uh so gra there's more to gravity even just from the newtonian point of view than we normally think about and uh, and that's just to you know to add to the uh, to the endless question, to the infinite questions <laughs> on, on this matter, no? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me start with the most important concept first. Uh, your first comment, that mm -hmm. this is something that has to be discussed around some beers or wine. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as the pandemic is over, you can invite me to come to Morelia and then we can go to a place to, to yeah. drink mm -hmm. a lot right. of my favorite baryonic matter. <laughs> and then we can talk about these things. Yeah, and about perfect. the rest, yes, this is very intriguing. In fact, if you if we, if we really live in a zero energy universe, what is responsible for all of this positive energy that we see around mm -hmm. is the negative binding energy of gravity. Exactly. <laughs> to compensate exactly. the positive energy of the rest of the universe. Yes. Right. Yeah, and 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 then it's funny because we all we always think of energy as a positive definite quantity like mass. But, it, but gravity is just the other way around. So yeah. there's something funny about gravity that we really, really don't understand. <laughs> you don't have to convince me about this. I'm a fan mm. of gravity. Mm -hmm. I really think that gravity is fundamentally different from all other forces. That's mm -hmm. why I personally don't believe about, about these theories that try to uh, force a quantum treatment of force upon gravity. Mm -hmm. May, I mean, in, in doubt, the gravity has to be quantized at one point. But I don't think that it should be quantized as the other force has been quantized. Mm -hmm. Gravity is a completely different beast, mm -hmm. okay? And it has to be looked at it differently. Oh, and speaking about that, it, it all, people always say that gravity is a long range force, but it's funny because it has exactly the same fo form as electro electromagnetic, uh, as the electrostatic force, for example. Uh, yet the electrostatic force is not such so long range. So where does the idea that gravity is a long range come from? It, it's not just from the fact that it's an R to the minus R to the minus two force, or is it? Or because electrostatic it's because, force it's, is the same. It's, because 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 it's, because it's, it's always attractive. Say that again. It's always attractive. Electromagnetic force can be attractive or repulsive. That's, That's why. Can I comment here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. yeah, so they, 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 they are, the equations are identical, but the difference is that matter is generally electrically neutral on average. Mm -hmm. And so the positive, as, as Rosa said, there are attractive and repulsive aspects to it. And on a scale larger than the Debye radius, mm -hmm. then they cancel out. That's the definition of the Debye radius, mm -hmm. where the, the shielding of the positive and negative 
um, charges is such that there is no longer any effective long range. Force. Yeah, but but then it is not really the force that is long or short range is the nature of the charges or the masses. Uh, it, it, the, the true yeah. reason for it being long range is that there's nothing to cancel it. But then it is not the it is not because of the force. It's because of the because you can have negative charges in the electro, um, electrostatic case, for example. So it's not really the the form of the force. Uh, it is the nature of the charges. No, no I think it's the is the nature of the force. But the laws are identical. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the the is the nature of the force is long range. You don't have that in in quantum forces. No, no, I, I, I was just saying the, electro, the electrostatic force, for example. Yeah, well, that's that's a long term also, a long range. The, the, the thing is that it cancels out. Exactly, but it would be long range if the if charges would, were uh, positive always, were always positive. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And, and water, <laughs> water is also very strange. Yeah, water is very strange. Yeah. Water is strange. So it turns out that our existence depends on all the, and these two things, at least, that are yeah. different from all the other things. That is true. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yet, I refuse to accept any anthropic uh, arguments, <laughs> right? Okay, because yeah. I, yeah. I always say that if the universe were different, then we would be different. And, and oh. what would exist would be exactly what can exist in, in that other universe. So uh, uh, anthropic principles is just like saying that I won the lottery because it was designed for me to win it. Uh, and that's not true. That's no. a very good argument. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the anthropic principle is to renounce to explain in anything. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like uh, saying it was designed to be like that. No, no, no. Yeah. So it's the last step be before getting religious. <laughs> <laughs> Great the talk. The universe was, was uh, designed for us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. Great. Gracias, Luis. Estuvo padre. Yeah, very interesting. Uh -huh. Bueno. Gracias, Luis. Gracias. Nada, pues Gracias. me dio mucho gusto platicar con ustedes y pues ya que pase todo esto me encantaría visitarlos. De de Órale. Muy bien, pues ya estamos vacunados ya pronto. Hey, yo también ya estoy vacunado, sí. esperamos que ya pronto esto fue la normalidad. Órale. Bueno, chao. Chao. Adiós. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Bye bye.